The Speaker of the House of Commons is apologizing again today over a video message he recorded, this time to a committee of MPs. Greg Fergus says he messed up when he made a video for a Liberal politician that was shown at a recent Ontario Liberal Party convention. Here's some of his testimony today. When I assumed the Speaker's chair, I spoke about the role being like a referee. And I think one thing Canadians know well is that referees make mistakes. Yeah, I blew that call. But I'm also telling you that I will do better. The fundamental rule of being Speaker is also one of the easier rules to follow. And that is you just don't do partisan things. I don't understand what was going through your mind as you were taping it. And did you consult with your chief of staff at any point to say, do you think this is a good idea? It was a mistake. I shouldn't have done it. All right, the CBC's Catherine Cullen is following the story. She, of course, is the host of the CBC podcast, The House. So, uh, Catherine, he apologized a lot. Do we get a sense whether MPs are ready to accept this apology and move on? Where are we? I would say, David, a real mixed bag. Interestingly, it was the Bloc Québécois who I think had some of the most devastating comments for Fergus today. Claude de Bellefay saying, listen, this is a job about judgment. The whole point of the job is that you have to make quick judgments. She said, Greg Fergus, you're a good person, but good judgment, it's not something you can learn. You have it or you don't. You obviously don't. Therefore, the Bloc Québécois cannot have confidence in you in the House of Commons. So, the, you know, really drawing a line there that there's no walking back from. The Conservatives also very critical. Uh, Andrew Shear in particular pushing the idea that Fergus's background, when you look at his CV, a lot of that work was partisan work. He was, you know, in, involved in National Council with the Liberals. Right. He was a young Liberal, etc. Uh, and suggesting that Fergus is just not far enough from that partisan instinct. He said, it's like seeing a ref give a pep talk to one of the teams before the game. Someone else made a comment about, well, listen, these are different leagues of hockey because, of course, a lot of this has to do with what he said at uh, for a video that was ultimately played yeah. at the Ontario Liberal Convention, although Greg Fergus insists he did not know that that was what was going to happen. The Liberals, you might not be surprised to hear, ultimately pretty sympathetic to Mr. Fergus. Uh, Sherry Romanato even seemed a bit emotional when she said, you know, you're new, we all make mistakes. So where does that leave us, David? It leaves us with the NDP. Peter Julian on the committee today saying... Um, this is very sad. He talked a bit, he was at his day, he was saddened by all of it, uh, but that he had a lot of questions as well that he was asking Greg Fergus, like, why did you decide to take that trip to Washington, D.C. when all of this was blowing up? Why didn't you cancel it? Why did you make right. those comments to the Globe and Mail? So it does seem like a lot of this is going to hang with the NDP. Yeah, I, I heard the different hockey league uh, analogy, right? Mm. But like, you know, the Ontario Liberals and the Federal Liberals are connected. It's more AHL and NHL, like it's the farm system in some way. But anyway, uh, where, where are we now? Like, what happens now? Because this is all about procedure and that's a bit opaque at times. What happens? Yes, yeah, so uh, my understanding is tomorrow they're going to actually write this report. The PROC knows it has to get moving, the report has to be written, but then, of course, you talk about procedure and process, it's got to be translated and whatnot. Um, it will be put before the House of Commons by Thursday at the absolute latest, but then there's a question of what happens. If this report says that three of the parties are not willing um, to side with Mr. Fergus, could still go to a vote. Mr. Fergus said today, you know, this is going to, I'm ultimately subject to the confidence of the House. It could right. still go to a vote. Or there's the question of whether or not that would send enough of a message that essentially he couldn't continue. I mean, really, even if ultimately Proc decides that there is some other remedy here that he uh, needs to put some sort of mechanism in place, which he says he's already done to avoid situations like this. The question that I think will continue to hang over all of this is two of the parties uh, represented in the House of Commons just clearly do not have faith in him. How is he going to continue to do this job? We will have a better sense of the path forward by the end of the week. It sounds like this might all get wrapped up before the holidays, but okay. uh, the, the clock's ticking. It's going to be a hot one to watch, David. Okay. All right, Catherine, thank you so much. That's the CBC's Catherine Cullen. Okay, we're going to get some more on this, and we're going to be joined by a group of uh, members of Parliament. Kevin Lamoureux is the Parliamentary Secretary to the Government House Leader. Jean-Denis Garon is the Bloc Québécois National Revenue Critic. And Rachel Blaney is the NDP's whip. Now, Power and Politics requested a Conservative MP to join this panel but no one was made uh, available. Okay, uh, I'm going to go right to you, Ms. Blaney, as the whip and the new Democrat. When I looked at the, the makeup of PROC, it's split pretty evenly between Liberals, Bloc, and Conservatives, and it seems like the deciding vote on all of this is going to come from your party. Where are you after what you heard today? Well, you know, this has been quite devastating, quite honestly. We, we appreciate uh, that these things can be... <laughs> 
complex, but it doesn't make sense to me. I think of the many times that I've stood in the house, you know, while the house was not in session and done videos for events that were happening across the country, specifically around veterans. And I was told very clearly by the sergeant at arms, as long as it's not partisan, Ms. Blaney, we will allow you to do this. And I also want to remind watchers uh, that Mr. Fergus was a page at one point. So I don't understand how this mistake could have been made. It's very clear uh, the pathway and the rules of the house. And they need to be in a role, the speaker, of neutrality. And it's a difficult thing to do in a partisan environment, but it absolutely must be done. So we're really struggling with this uh, reality and trying to do what's best for the House of Commons. And I know PROC is doing its work right now. And we're waiting to hear what that report brings us back. But, but it sounds to me like you're not ruling out uh, joining the bloc and the Conservatives in, in voicing non-confidence in Mr. Fergus and, and potentially pushing out the second speaker this year. Well, can you imagine this reality that we're in, that this is something that we're even considering? Uh, I never expected this to be the reality, and here we are having to consider very seriously the role of the speaker and what next steps to take at a time that we're dealing with important things. So, you know, I really appreciate uh, the work that PROC is doing, and I look forward to seeing that report. Okay, so Mr. Lamoureux, I, I, I know uh, Liberals today were suggesting the apology and the admission of, of the error in judgment would be enough. Uh, but to use some parliamentary language, it doesn't sound like a, there's a prima facie case that the apology has gotten it all done. And, and there still could be an unpleasant report coming from Proc later this week. Well, I, I would like to, to back it up maybe just a little bit, if I, if I may. Sure. You know, when the, uh, Mr. Scheer had brought forward a motion uh, of privilege, um, the feeling was is that he was uh, being very much uh, genuine and wanting to express uh, concern. Um, even myself and uh, members of the uh, Liberal Caucus uh, saw this as, as something that was uh, serious. And the, the uh, acting or the deputy speaker came back saying that uh, let's let's see if we can resolve this issue and invited a motion from the official opposition. In that motion, it said very very clearly that uh, we're going to look at PROC to come up with a remedy. The problem that I have is that during that particular debate, we had two parties, in particular my focus is on the Conservative Party, but there was two opposition parties that came right out and said, we want him to resign. And so it seems to me that the, the cart got ahead of the horse here. Uh, it's either you have confidence in, in PROC and what's taking place in PROC. Uh, we've approached this uh, with a very much an, an open mind. We understand that mistakes do happen. Um, and in, in this situation, it would have been uh, my preference to see uh, you know, a, a, a remedy as was instructed. Uh, to come from PROC in which uh, we would have some sort of a consensus uh, on the issue. And uh, you know whether it was inside the House or at committee, uh, Mr. Fergus has expressed uh, his, his apologies. Uh, and I take people as all honorable. That's what our House rules uh, say, uh, believing at the end of the day um, that there's something to be learned from this. Well, Jean-Denis Garon, uh, uh, your response to that, that uh, the bloc jumped to conclusions, uh, uh, arguably, in, in calling for him to resign, and, and your that's Mr. Lamoureux's position, not mine. I'm summarizing, just to make that clear. And, and your, your reaction to what Mr. Fergus, Speaker Fergus, had to say at committee today? Well, we didn't jump to conclusions. People watching us from home, they know pretty well that when they apply on the job, they have to be qualified. And if you want to qualify to be, qualified to be Speaker of the House, you have to have two qualities. You have to be new neutral and you have to show judgment. These are non-negotiable qualities and Mr. Fergus has repeatedly shown us over the last few days and weeks that he didn't have those two qualities. So he first uh, made that mistake of using the House resources to do that partisan video. Then he didn't apologize. He apologized. Uh, he showed himself to be sorry because it was made public. And afterwards, he did it again. He went to Washington, D.C. And, uh, and made a partisan speech in Washington, D.C., so he did it again. So uh, Mr. Fergus is not sorry. So being a Speaker of the House is all about having the confidence of the House. Mr. Fergus has a past uh, has a past history. He was, has always been a partisan MP, he was secretary, uh, parliamentary secretary, the prime minister. And we had expressed some doubt when he uh, was uh, voted in. And if he stays, and it's very important to say that, if he stays, 
he sets a precedent, and all speakers of the house in the future will somewhat gain the right to do exactly the same thing, and that would be unacceptable for the country and for the institution that is the House of Commons. Right. So, so Mr. Lamoureux, just, just respond to some of that, if you can. I, the, the way, the circumstances around uh, Mr. Ferguson's election as speaker didn't give him the clean slate of a new parliament because he was replacing someone sort of, you know, mid-mandate. So I, I get that he came from, from the caucus as opposed to straight from the electoral rolls. But this decision to go uh, on the trip to Washington, which was planned when he was an MP, before he was speaker, uh, and, and was allowed to proceed while he was speaker, even though he was in the middle of all of this, and then the ethics finding against him from earlier this year when he was a parliamentary secretary, which was again a question of judgment. Not so much, uh, he, he wrote a letter requesting more diverse programming on Quebec television, which wasn't a problem in and of itself, but it was deemed to be an ethics failure because he was a parliamentary secretary. So there's a pattern of this now. Uh, how does that play in terms of the decision making Parliament has to make about this going forward? Well, well what I know about Mr. Mr. Fergus is something in which all parliamentarians uh, know that he was very much an, an active uh, individual in, uh, in Parliament. It started off as a page, maybe even before that. Um, and what I would uh, to emphasize is that, remember, in a minority situation, he had to get a majority of members of parliament to vote for him in order to become the speaker. And he achieved that. So I think that we need to recognize uh, that uh, to be human is to err. There is no such thing as a perfect uh, person. And he made a mistake. And he's apologized not once, but a couple times Pretty that I'm aware error. of. And at the, at the end of the day, I understand the importance of the speaker's office. And my biggest concern has been, can uh, procedures in House Affairs actually make a decision based on the type of things that have been said by Mr. Scheer and others uh, inside prior to PROC even getting uh, underway. Um, I'm, that's an issue that causes great concern. And as I say, I think that if every, each and every one of us look in a mirror and ask, have we ever made a mistake? I suspect there would be a lot of yeses. Right. And uh, at the end of the day, uh, I don't uh, believe uh, that uh, members uh, should be writing that off as quickly as they have been. Okay, I want to go to Mr. Garon again and, and then Ms. Blaney just uh, to wrap up. But Mr. Garon, uh, if this video had never gone public, would this have been a firing offense in your view? If this was a private message to a longtime friend rather than something that they say was a mistake that I got to play publicly, would you still be calling for Greg Fergus to quit? Well, I would have known it, but it was, would have been a, a, a very important mistake. And Mr. Lamoureux says he apologized, but apologizing doesn't erase the mistake. And people get fired every day from their jobs for making substantial mistakes. And as I said, I mean, I, I, and there's also a, a comment that I heard around that, that need needs to be addressed. People say, look, it's a bad time. It's the end of session. It's not a good time for Mr. Fergus to leave. But there is never a good time for a Speaker of the House of Commons to stop being neutral, to start being partisan. There, is, there never is a good time for that. And Mr. Fergus, if he cares about the institution, if he cares about the work that we're doing here at the House of Commons, right. he would leave right away by himself out of, res out of respect for the institution that he is supposed to represent. So, so, Ms. Blaney, uh, I, I, we don't yet know what PROC is going to decide, but I think the disposition of the New Democrats to go back to where this started is probably the critical one. So uh, I, I don't know if you've dis discussed this yet with your caucus, but did what you heard today make your decision easier or harder as a caucus? And where do you think you're leaning? Well, you know, <laughs> this whole incident has been really disappointing. And to go back to the question you asked earlier, even if this was done privately, it's still an inappropriate use of the House resources. And we are looking for leadership that has judgment and is really uh, connected to the fact that they represent the whole House, and so we need that nonpartisan. I think this is a difficult uh, conversation. It is an uncomfortable thing to be in a place where we're asking, you know, to review a second second speaker so closely, um, and we are all having hard conversations about what that looks like. But this has been incredibly disappointing and really doesn't show the strong judgment that we think that a speaker should have. So, so just as the last question, Ms. Blaine, will we know uh, one way or another what happens with Mr. Fergus before the end of this week? I certainly hope so.